Well, greetings. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here with our fifth lesson today on a message. Uh, what do we say this? A message of repentance. Kind of hard to believe it's already the fifth week, but when you start jumping into a series, it just kind of all begins to fly. And for those that are here in person in Richardson, welcome. Glad you guys are here. You're always an answer to prayer whenever you guys show up. Uh, we have some friends online uh, that are going to be joining us uh, all the way from Malawi. Uh, we have some friends from Minnesota, some friends from Flint, Michigan. Uh, and then we have our, our crew. That I think it's always fun. We do have a different camera guy. He's a regular to everybody. Uh, but Drew Gibbs, everybody, Drew, would you like to say hello? Uh, wow. What? Drew and I just got back last night from Baylor University. Uh, we were hanging out with some students uh, where the last semester we were training and equipping them to share the gospel. And then this semester, they have taken over. Amen. And they have run with it. They have done the work. And so last night, it was really cool. We didn't know they were going to do this. They then commissioned the seniors to take it off and run. Anyway, it's just a real blessing just to be a part of people that are excited, right, to embrace the gospel uh, in a younger generation. And uh, so Drew's a part of our team. He's been a part of our team for a long time. But Rich Goodwin, you want to say hello? You and Shelly in the back room. Greetings from the back room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Drew. Welcome. Hello. And He's always <laughs> welcome to Kev. And then we do have the Kev. Uh, you know, Rich, last week, or Shelly, I don't know who did this. They did some new graphics, just so everybody knows. So... We do ask that you guys call him and refer to him as the Kev. That's what he prefers. Um, so there he is. And apparently I'm known as Dr. Kyle. So anyway, we're getting creative apparently when you talk about repentance for five weeks, okay? So anyway, and then Elizabeth Goodwin is over there in the corner. There's no camera, but uh, this is an awesome team uh, that we get to run with and have been running with for quite a long time. And so my wife, Laura, doesn't have a microphone. She doesn't have a camera, but I bet there's an overall shot maybe uh, that Laura is here, and Laura is a part of the sounding out process. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of this. This is a message today. Uh, I see some of our friends that have jumped on uh, from Nigeria. We have our friends from Cameroon. I, it, isn't that mind-blowing to you? It is to me. It's 7 or 8 o'clock at night in Africa, and they are able to tune in with their data, with their internet, and they can jump in. And I, that just is, it's humbling, uh, and I'm very thankful. So Lord, we just ask that you would bless this time today. God, that you would prepare our hearts for the, the word that you have and you want to, to be released. And Holy Spirit, I do want to ask for a spirit of humility today. Lord, that you would communicate uh, through me, uh, that Lord, this would come across in a, in a humble manner, but also to be received uh, in humility. Uh, God, may we take the word for what it says, and may we learn from it and grow from it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the text that started all of this, uh, I love to always kind of start this off because I think this is important. How did you and why are you talking about a message of repentance? Uh, because the Lord gave us a dream. We had a dream that we saw a nation in Africa, Malawi, called the nation, the president I saw in this dream called the nation to repent. And by God's grace, we continue to walk this out. And it, and it is happening. Uh, we're going to be going there very soon, uh, working with the local church, working with the president, working with his spiritual advisor. Like this morning, this is what we've been communicating. Like, it's really humbling, you guys, when a nation wants to, to call uh, everybody to repent. I don't, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And it comes, and it's based off of Acts 26, verse 19 and 20. You'll see this on the screen. Therefore, Paul says, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those, and watch this, in different areas. Damascus first, to those in Jerusalem, and then in all the Judea, region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles. In other words, remember this. This is important. I think this is important. This message that Paul had was not limited to one place. This message of Paul, this message of repentance, was not just limited to, oh, I'm going to stay just in this region. This message of repentance is meant for everybody. And here's what he says, they should repent, this is our language that we have, so when we turn, we should repent, and the scripture says, turn to God. Remember, we are looking, we're changing our mind, and we're asking God to change our heart, we're turning to him, and then here's the key that I think is what we need in every nation, we need to do works worthy of repentance. So if we really are confessing and repenting of a lying lifestyle, maybe you're a compulsive liar, or you have issues with uh, let's just say pornography, you have issues of fornication, you have issues of alcoholism. Scripture says you can confess that, but when you repent, you shouldn't run to that and you should radically change. And people should see these things in your life. 
And so we use that as a backdrop for all of this. So the, these last couple of weeks, all we've done is focus on the word repent. Remember, we got into the second lesson, and the second lesson talked about in Romans 2, God's kindness does what, Kevin? What drives us to repent. Amen. So because God keeps giving us his grace, his kindness, his love, and he just says, okay, Kyle, I know you've messed up, but I'm going to show you my love. Would you turn to me now? And then guess what? I do it again, and then he keeps pouring out his kindness. That's what he did to the Israelites, and that's what he's doing with us. He wants to extend his grace. He wants to extend his mercy. So his kindness should draw us to repent and say, God, I'm sorry for what I've done, and I'm not going back. That's the backdrop. Now we got into the third lesson, right? Do you remember the third lesson, Kevin? It comes from what text? Matthew 4, 17. Yeah, Matthew 4, 17. In fact, I heard today on Malawi radio, okay? I got I to gotta share this sometime with you guys. It is the best African music behind the, like they're doing this, uh, this radio, and they're announcing that they're calling the nation to repent. And do you know they ran with Matthew 4, 17 on their ad? On the radio, they're saying Matthew 4, 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now remember this, that whole come near mentality is Jesus has not what, Kevin? What has not happened at that point? He had not died and went to be buried and resurrected. That's right. So he's saying, look, everything that you've seen according to the law and to the prophets, major and minor, everything that you've seen, I am standing right here. Now, Now everything has come to fruition yet. I haven't died. I wasn't, I wasn't killed, right? I haven't come back to life. So he says, repent, turn to what these guys are saying, and I am him. That's why he's saying I've come near. So he's giving what? The Jewish people a chance, right? That's what he's doing. He's giving the Jewish people, Kevin, am I right? Is this where we're at? Correct. So he's giving them God's kindness is coming through Jesus saying, guys, please look back to the law and the prophets. You get to the fourth lesson, it's going to continue to build. Now we're in Acts 3. When you get into Acts 3, the same language of who? Peter is now articulating the gospel to the same mentality, to the same Jews. But now this time, Jesus has died. He's come back to life. And so the death, burial, and resurrection has happened. And so then he says, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that the seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may, it says in verse 20, send Jesus who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. So now he's saying, hey guys, I need you to repent because all of the signs have been shown to you that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, everything, Kevin, what I didn't know about repentance in Scripture, it all builds on each other. I I didn't see it like that. You know, I always thought of one word, I think we all think this, you know, repent or perish, right? You see guys holding up all these signs, kind of mentality. But man, God's kindness is constantly saying, no, no, I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving you a chance. So last week, he was giving the Jews a chance. This week, I want to get into the Gentiles. I want to get into Revelation. And so you can see the process. Now, this message in Revelation, chapter 2, okay, this is the, the backdrop. As you guys know, that there are, Kevin, how many churches does the, the, the writer John write to? In, in he has, he's basically writing the seven different churches in the, what he's been given That's right. from the Lord. He's writing to seven different churches. He's hanging out on an island, <laughs> right? And so, Kevin, here's what I want to do. I want to go to Revelation 2, verse 1, and then I'll unpack Ephesus. I'll unpack all of that, but I want to give you a backdrop. So this is the very first church in Revelation that he's writing a message to. Now, there's always patterns in all of these seven different churches, right? But in Revelation 2, he says, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, okay? So you're actually writing a letter. You're writing this to the angel. So what does that say, Kevin, uh, about an angel, Is it fair to say that an angel could be assigned to the church? Correct. Right, absolutely. You could have an angel actually assigned to the church of America, to the church of Africa, or the church of Botswana, or the church of Malawi, the church of Russia. Like, God could actually assign angels. Angels are what? Hebrews, it says they're ministering spirits. So that we could what? Help advance the kingdom of God. I think that's important to understand. Angels are here to help us do the work. Miss Penny is in the room. Penny, I remember when we were in Seattle, Washington, And I remember somebody had a dream, and this dream was is that they saw all along the port of Seattle, all of these angels sleeping on these front porches of these apartments. But when our team had come in and called, called the church to wake up and go out and share the gospel, they had another dream months later, and the angels were up doing the work with us in the city of Seattle. Why do I like that? Because I think the angels sometimes don't have a whole lot of work to do. 
And you're going to see this, and he's saying in Revelation 2, the angel is going to start delivering a message. And when you get into Revelation 2, verse 1, it says, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold, gold lampstands says, you can keep it right there in verse 1. Okay, so the one is in reference to who, Kevin? It's to Christ. It's Christ. So Christ, okay, in the book of Revelation, he holds seven stars. Now, if you go to Revelation uh, 1, Kevin, specifically verse 20, did I get, uh, no, not one. Why did I say that? Uh, Revelation, yeah, Revelation 1, verse 20. Uh, no. Okay. Thanks. If you just go to verse 20, it says, The secret of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So this isn't some me coming up with some theory. The angels are these seven stars. Scripture says that's what they are. So Jesus is holding seven stars, seven angels, and then he says the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So now if you go back to Revelation 2 verse 1, I think this should help us have an understanding, right? So Jesus, who holds the seven stars, they're who? What are the stars? The angels. He holds the angels, and then it says he walks among the seven gold lampstands. So now what is Jesus doing, practically? He's walking among the seven churches, okay? Don't make this harder. Sometimes I think when we think of Revelation, Wendy, we did a long study, right? <laughs> right? To, to number our days. 32 weeks of this. When you simplify the scriptures and start a, it, like understanding the word, it, it comes to life. Now, this is kind of an interesting text. I think, Kevin, I don't know if I have this. Let me, Lord, I might not have this. I want to just see one thing, Kevin. It's found in Leviticus. And I might not. I was studying earlier about this text. I was like, you know, that really makes a lot of sense here. Lord, show me. Okay, we'll just keep going on here. If it comes to me, I'll, I'll bring it back. So Jesus is walking into seven churches. Now, those seven churches, okay, that you're going to find over the course of Revelation 2 and 3 are these churches right here, okay? So this letter that, the gospel, that John is writing, right, it, John has a letter, and it's go. What we're going to talk about today is in Ephesus, right? One of the letters goes to Ephesus. This is the first church. Then it's go to Smyrna, okay? Uh, then it's going to go to Pergamum. Then it's going to go to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So you have seven, seven letters. That's the lampstands. What are the lampstands? Can everybody just understand what's the lampstand? I'm going to keep saying this because when we get to the message of what we're talking about, you have to understand what a lampstand is. And it's going to sound forward, it's going to sound harsh, but if we don't understand Revelation 1 verse 20, when it says that the lampstands are the churches, you're going to get confused about what this message is about. The lampstand is the church. Okay, so Kevin, let's go to Revelation 2 verse 1 again. Ephesus. Ephesus in, in itself, is, it's an unbelievable seaport. Okay, it's a leading seaport in all of this. Constable, Tom Constable gives a great definition of Ephesus. Uh, not because I've studied a ton of this, but I have a little bit of depth. It's, a, it's the capital of a Roman promise, province of Asia. You know, Paul evangelized here. It became a base of ministry. Do you remember this? For three years. So like Ephesus was like Paul's turf. Paul understood Ephesus. There's a commercial center. It's on the mouth of a river uh, in all of this. It's also the center of the worship uh, of Artemis, Diana, the goddess of fertility one of the seven wonders of the world. And so here you have all of these dynamics, the commercialism, this false religion, and then Paul. <laughs> and in that, you have Paul, and in that, and as Paul is there, what I love about this text is, is that you also then see leaders growing up in this. Like, this is a strong community. This is a strong, strong church. Uh, and I think what Paul is, and what you're going to begin to see in this, is that Paul really wants to make sure that the believers are making themselves distinct from everybody else. Kevin, anything else you want to add about Ephesus? Remember, the writer in Revelation is John. Paul was the one that spent a lot of the time there. Don't mix them up. Everybody catch that? Paul is the one spending time there. Thanks, Kevin, for that. That's good. And John's the one writing about all this. And as, you, as you're going to see, you're going to hear a lot of Paul language in all of this. And, and I do think this, what's going to happen today, and I, I like what uh, Wearsby says, today's going to serve as an x-ray. 
Like it's an x-ray for the church of Ephesus. Wendy, I've actually seen on your Facebook post. Okay, you're like, oh, which one? (laughs) Uh, You just said, like if Paul was in the business, I'm going to paraphrase this. This is what I took away. If Paul was in the business of writing letters, the church of America would get one. We need an x-ray that Jesus would evaluate as he's walking amongst the church in America, as he's walking amongst the church of Botswana or Malawi, whatever church it is, if he was walking amongst us, what would he reveal? That's what today is about. He's going to reveal, I believe, the good, the bad, the ugly, and even the good again. (laughs) And so in this process, if you would, Jesus is, remember, he's walking around, and he's going to begin to inspect The seven churches. We know that the churches are the lampstands. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. I mean, this is a classic, uh, you know, what do we call these things, Kevin? Uh, Reprimand sandwich. Yeah, reprimand sandwich. You're like... I love you, but I've got some issues with you. And you're doing great. Like, that's the whole deal. Like, you know, if you have something to say, you soften it. Here's the hard stuff. This is the stuff that he's going to say right away. And I think it's legit. I think it's true. He says, I know your works, your labor, and your endurance. And you cannot tolerate evil. Like, this is not a bad thing. This is not a bad thing at all. And he said, these different things, I know who you are. I know the works that you've done. And in fact, you guys have been a faithful church for over probably 40 plus years at this point. Like, you guys are consistent in what you're doing. I recognize that. You've tested those who call themselves apostles, and they're not. I love that, by the way. Like, these guys from Ephesus hold this thing to be true. And they say, hey, by the way, people that are trying to enter in, those that are not aligned to this, they're false. You found them to be liars. And in fact, Paul, Kevin, if you'll go there, in Acts 20, verse 29, talks about this in Ephesus. This is actually a fulfillment of what we're talking about. In Acts 20, verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul already says this is happening. The gospel, or sorry, the writer John says this in Revelation. Like, this is the reality of what happens in a church. Doesn't matter where you're at. As we talk to people in Africa, this happens in Africa. This happens in America. People just start creeping in. And he says, by the way, I love this in Revelation 2, verse 2. You guys don't put up with it. And in fact, you called them out to be liars. You found them to be liars. He's complimenting them in what they are doing. And in fact, when you even look at this word labor, you guys have this mentality. I love what Warren Wiersbe says. You're going to toil to the point of exhaustion. You are going to keep doing the work, and you're not going to stop. I recognize your ethic. Like in northern Indiana, where I'm originally from, it's like a factory town. And that factory town, you guys know what you do in factories? You just keep pumping it out. You don't stop. You don't stop. You don't stop. Whether you like that imagery or not, that's what's happening in the church of Ephesus. They're just keeping going. They're going, they're going. That labor, that's what we're talking about. This labor keeps steadfast. You're enduring until the end. He says in verse 3, he continues on, you also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name. And have not grown weary. I think when there's a steadfastness, it begins to produce character. It begins to produce maturity. Like Jesus is walking around the church of Ephesus. The same church that Paul was there where he launched leaders. Where Paul was there and he began to launch Timothy. He began to launch John. Like these are legit guys. That at some point were in this church and now they're no longer there. So he saw all that took place. So let me understand, let me guys understand something. When when we're talking about where we're going to go today, it means it started off really well. I mean, I think about, you guys, some of the most incredible uh, seminaries and colleges in the United States. They were founded, Larry Hopkins, you know this, they, they were founded on scriptural truth. They used to have statues of truth, statues of these people, men and women, that lived according to the word. And now if you go into these days, it's really confusing because savage wolves have crept in and changed the truth. So when I, I want to say something, like I believe that the church in Ephesus was established on good ground. And I think for 30 to 40 years, according to the scriptures, they did the work. They did the works, the labor, the endurance. He said you possess endurance and you've tolerated many things because of my name, because of Christ. 
And I love this. You, you, haven't even grown, you haven't even grown weary. Like you have stayed the course. It's interesting. When you get to verse 3, though, we, in verse 4, sorry, verse 4, we begin to turn the corner. I don't know, Kevin, if the tone changed. <laughs> hey, guys, I love what you're doing, but. And here's the but. But I have this against you. Can you imagine Jesus saying, I have something against you? I would find the yellow chair as fast as I could. And let me just say this. In order to receive verse 4, we have to walk this in humility. Have you guys ever tried to correct somebody and it's never been received? Why? They just push back. I've been a person that has pushed back on things. Why? Because when there's pride on anything in your life, you will not receive truth. Is that fair? Kevin, that makes sense? Total sense. And I, I think for me, verse 4 has to be the turning point for any church in the, in the world. Now, when I say church, I'm not talking Baptist church. I'm not talking Methodist church. I'm talking church of Dallas. I'm talking church of Texas. I'm talking church, corporate church, like the denominational deal, you guys. That's, it's not in scripture, by the way. In fact, uh, if you go, I don't even know why. I'm going to trust the Lord on this. If you go to verse 6, do you remember he has a, another positive thing, Revelation 2, verse 6? He says, yeah, you do have this. So I'm not even getting into the things that he doesn't like yet. He then gives them a positive at the end of verse 6. He said, yeah, you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus does not like that. So you've got all these, all these positives. He's got incredible labor, incredible works, incredible endurance, and you don't, tell, and like, you don't put up with stuff. You keep the course. And then he says in verse 6, he says, you even hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. Many people think the Nicolaitans are based on Nicholas in Acts 6, verse 5. The Nicholas, who is one of the seven. If you'll go there, Kevin, Acts 6, verse 5. We can't dogmatically prove it, but many people think this is the proselyte from Antioch. The proposed pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen. We, guys, we know Stephen, who was killed, right? A man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Philip, who was Philip. Remember Philip in Acts 8? Remember the guy that actually led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord? So these guys were servers and waiters, and then they became incredible powerful men of God delivering the gospel. One of them, it says also, is Procurius, Nacanar, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. Some people tie Acts 6, 5 to Revelation 2, verse 6. Again, it's not 100% dogmatic, but many, many theologians and historians do. And one of the things that the Nicolaeans were known for is they conquered people. They were a sect who lorded it over the church. Listen to this. This is really, this is mind-blowing to me, okay? Uh, they lorded it over the church, and then they robbed people of their liberty. This was the group that began to initiate, here this is, this is huge. They initiated the clergy and the laity language. So all of a the sudden, they became a hierarchy. Does that make sense? Like, I'm for pastors, I'm for bishops, I'm for all of those labels, but not to the point, you guys, where they become more special than somebody else in the body of Christ. And what happened is, according to Nicolaians, they were saying, hey, by the way, you guys elevated people, and that's not biblical. And the Ephesians didn't like that either. So they had all of these things according to, I guess you can say, even according to, to the law. And let me just back this up, because somebody out there is going to have a hard time with this. Overseas, we have hierarchies, okay? In the United States, we have hierarchies. I think it's fair to say in, in 1 Peter 2, 9, if you'll go there, Kevin, 1 Peter 2, 9, all God's people, all God's people are kings and priests. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. In other words, you guys, there, there's no difference and what's happened is, is that the Nicolaeans, for some reason, elevated people, maybe so they could get paid, maybe they could have a different title, but the Ephesians said, that's not right. And Jesus said, you're right, that's not right. There's nothing biblical about elevating somebody that has a title when you don't think you're that important. And so for me, I'm not taking away the titles because if something God's using you for, please do not hoard that over people. And the Ephesians said, we don't like that. And Jesus says, I hate that as well. Isn't that crazy? So these are the positive things. Everybody okay with this? The Ephesians are looking pretty good. They're doing everything that looks right. 
They can hold this and say, this is true. They can hold other people accountable for this. This is true. But when you go to Revelation 2, verse 4, this is when we begin to hit the hot buttons. This is when we begin to stand on some things that begin to rub people the wrong way. And I love what Pastor Gordy Hinkey, he's one of my mentors out of Indiana, he says, I didn't write this, I just read it. He says, I have this against you. Jesus says this against the lampstand of Ephesus. I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Okay, without even moving on in verse four, he says you have abandoned the love that you have had at first. Everybody in this room, I I know you, most of you, some of you. (laughs) I don't know everybody online, but I do think it's a fair statement that when you first fell in love with Jesus, you recognized you went from death to life. You realized your life had been radically changed. You've been set free from all of those things, and there's this initial love that you had that you always want to keep coming back for more. Horrible analogy, but if anybody has ever been a drug addict in your past, The reason you're a drug addict is because why? You go after that same first hit that you had the very first time. You want that first high. I know it's a horrible analogy, but what I'm telling you is is you want that. When I first saw my wife, Laura, I was at Taylor University. I was taking a freshman test. I love this story because it's, it's so radical and it has to be of the Lord. Laura didn't even know this was taking place. We were taking our freshman orientation class. And she was walking up and she was handing in her paper. I didn't know her name. I didn't know where she's from. I'd never seen her in my life. And she handed in a paper. I'm probably in the 40th row, 50th row. And I leaned over to a guy who I didn't even know his name. And I said, you see that girl up there? He goes, yeah. I go, that's the girl I'm going to marry. And he goes, what's her name? I go, I don't know. (laughs) Where is she from? I don't know. (laughs) But there was, and just for you know, Laura didn't have that same feeling at first. But I did. But there is something about that moment when you just know you're in love. And when you know that Jesus Christ, who's God, he came here on earth and he went for 32, 33 years and he went through all of that hell and he took on all of our punishment. He was killed and three days later he came back to life. When you realize that that's what he's done, you have fallen in love with the Messiah. And you know what he says to the church of Ephesus? You've forgotten that. You have forgotten what Jesus has done for you. He doesn't even just say you've forgotten. He says you have what? You've abandoned the love that you have had first. I don't know, Rich, for those that are in the back room, when you hear the word abandon, what, what comes to your mind when you, when you talk about that word abandon? I think it's left empty, desolate. We think of a house that has moved out and just been left abandoned for ruins. It's just gone. It's almost like you have to intentionally, what, Kevin? You have to intentionally, like, choose that. Yeah, otherwise it's like somebody's decided to leave it alone. Yeah. You've. You've made a choice. You've made a choice. Can you go to Ephesians 1, verse 15 and 16? I I love what David Padgett wrote here. He's from Texas. He wrote on the screen. He said, then it started to become uh, uh, no longer about God, right? The culture changed, right? The culture changed when we're not keeping our eyes on him, and then it becomes more about what? Us. This is why Ephesians 1, verse 15. This is Paul's letter, right, to the church of Ephesus. This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as you remember in my prayers. They had the love for Jesus. This wasn't they didn't have it. Kevin, one of the questions we're going to have to address at the end is, is did they ever have the love? Right? They're going to get into this question. It's going to get sticky. It sure looks like they did here from it, Paul's letter. According to Paul's letter, they had the love. I think that's important to understand because there's a lot of people that say, well, you know, maybe, maybe they never turned to the Lord in the first place. You guys ever, you ever done that game before? You know somebody, do they know the Lord? Do they not know the Lord? Well, maybe they never truly loved him. According to this in Ephesians 1, the Ephesians loved the Lord. They loved the Lord and he said, you abandoned. That word abandon, I can't think of anything more drastic than that. Kevin, if you'll go to Ephesians 6, verse 24, please. Ephesians 6, verse 24. 24. 
Ephesians 6.24 says, Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to emphasize this. I'm going to hit this hard today. The church of Ephesus had an undying love for Jesus. At one point in their ministry, when they were established in Christ, they were sold out for him. I think this is important to understand. We're going to set the tone. This is a church for Jesus Christ. This is not a question of their false teaching or a false doctrine. They radically love Jesus, and it's undying. An undying love is that they are what? It just means this. I think, and I, I like a couple different words. It just means they were fervent. They were personal. They were uninhibited. They were excited, and they openly displayed their affection for Jesus Christ. Wearsby also continues, and he says, the devotion to Christ is so often characterizes new believers. You know when you're a new believer? Have you ever guys seen new believers? Man, I, I've, I love watching baptisms. Have you ever watched funny baptisms before? And you're like, what's so funny about a baptism? Well, at least in America, when, when new believers get in the tank and they're getting ready, you just don't know what they're going to say. It's so raw. It's so funny. And there's no filter. Oh, yeah, I was this. And now I'm this. And when they say this, it's not sometimes the cleanest language. You want to know why? Because they recognize the filth that they have become, and now they're wearing the, clobe, uh, the, the robe of righteousness. And I think over the course of time, we lose that passion for Jesus Christ. I mean, let's face it, in a marriage, you have to keep what? Working at your marriage. Or I will tell you, it can become over here and not passionate over here. The same goes for our, our ministry with Christ. And so you have this perspective. You have this, uh, and I I'm going to say this again about a marriage. Wearsby says this, when a husband and a wife begin to take each other for granted, and life becomes routine, then the marriage is in danger. Can I apply that to the church? When you and I begin to take Jesus for granted, and life becomes routine, our walk with the Lord is in danger. It becomes stagnant. It becomes stale. And if we're not careful, people don't even know you have the light of Christ. And I think when I keep coming back to this Revelation 2 verse 4, we go through the motions is what he's saying, and there's not a real love for Jesus. And the Ephesians were truly neglecting adoration. Listen to this, please. And I, uh, I, I think I'm going I'm to write this quote down if we can. Uh, this comes from Warren Wearsby here, uh, and, and Wearsby just says this, labor, right? That's what they're known for, right? They've got some great characteristics. Kevin, what are the characteristics that he complimented them for? Undying love, and just... Hey, go back to Revelation 2. Revelation 2, verse oh, 2. They're, he's, they're sorting out uh, who's a false stock teacher, making sure they don't, you know, call them that, and then they've been... Enduring through all of it. They have incredible endurance. They have incredible works. They have incredible labor. But labor is no substitute for love. <laughs> this is an interesting word. Neither is purity for passion. I think you guys, we have, we've mistaken things that look good on the outside. When the heart is empty on the inside. So here's what he does. John writes to the church of Ephesus from Christ, delivered from an angel, right? This is kind of the mentality. And he says, but I have an option for you. I have an out for you. And he says in verse 5 of Revelation 2, he says, remember then how far you have fallen. So the first step to overcome any of this, right? The first step to overcome this abandoning our love. H how do we get out of this rut? How do we get out of this routine? How do we become awakened to the truth? Well, he, he gives us an answer. He says, first of all, remember how far you have fallen. 
Kevin, what's that imply? What does John say in here? He's like, there's a starting point where you went to, and now you're here. You got to recognize how far that, what the distance is for that. There's a big distance. Somewhere, somehow, only you guys know. Only the Holy Spirit can show you, show you online, show me. When we first started, do you remember where we were? There was an innocence almost. I remember when I was 12 years old, I came to know the Lord in Washington, D.C. It was at a Youth for Christ event. I was in the backstage. An older lady literally was sharing the gospel. And I just remember a light bulb just went off. And I was like, I've heard this all my whole life, but wow, now this makes sense. And it began a journey for me as a 12-year-old of what it meant to passionately pursue the Lord. It wasn't pretty all the time, but I want to go back to that moment when that light bulb went off, what Christ did for me. I think before we move on, I just, for a second, for those that are online, for those that are here, could you just, okay, Lord, when was that first time I fell in love with you? When was the first time the spirit of the living God revealed who Christ was as Messiah. I'm going to say something a little strange. Some of you might not ever know. And I'm just going to say, maybe you've never trusted in him in the first place. You see, the remembering part means you have something that's already established. The Ephesians had something established already. Remember how far you've come. And if you start processing this, they're probably like, wow, it's probably not good. In humility, if we realize how far we've come, we're open to this message today. Number two in the, Kevin, you have anything you want to add to this? No, I think that's, it's key for what we're going to keep working through this thing is remember you got to remember the starting point. That's right. And then he also says, we must repent. That's what he says. Remember then how far you've fallen and repent. So when we realize this is who I was in Christ, and you're like, man, I'm not even here. I'm over here. Scripture says, well, then repent from it. Recognize the sin in your life and repent, Right? Turn from those things and turn to God. Again, this sounds so repetitive, you guys, but I think it's true. I think the church in America has fallen out of love with Christ. Now, I'm going to prove it here in a little bit. And my goal is not to denounce the church. My goal is not to come after the church and be negative. My, my goal is in this is to paint a real picture. If we want to see a move of God in any environment, whatever country, you guys, we got to remember what Christ has done and then realize we have come a long ways and maybe not for the the good. And he says, once you repent, now watch this, then here it is again. You guys, this sounds just like Acts 26, 19 and 20. Do, what does it say? In Acts 2, it says then, he says, do the works you did at first. Kevin, what's that sound like? Sounds like uh, Acts 19. If there's genuine repentance, we'll see the fruit in your life. We'll see the fruit in my life. It's Matthew 3, if you'll go there, Kevin. Matthew 3, verse 17. I think this is the text. Matthew 3, verse 17. It's the same language, you guys, as the works. Nope, that's not the language. Uh, Maybe it's Matthew 4, 17, actually. If this is wrong, Lord, help me. Uh, That's not it either. Hang on, before I just keep guessing now. Uh, It's the fruit of repentance verse. Why do I not have that down? Does anybody? Uh, There it is, verse 8. Sorry, Matthew 3, verse 8. Matthew 3, verse 8, to me, is the same thing as do the works of repentance. Produce fruit consistent with repentance. So when we remember who Christ is in our life, and then we actually then repent of how far we have fallen, guess what happens? We'll begin to do the works. Uh, the American church, you guys, statistically, like we don't share the gospel. Less than maybe 3%. And I think that's pushing it, by the way. Yeah, the works might be, hey, I'm going to serve somebody. I'm going to help somebody. I, I get it. There's pockets that people are doing this. But the reality is if we really are in this process and living out this, America would be radically different. Kevin. Like it's not just do the works that you did at first. So it's going back to point one and that 
point in time and say, go do those. It comes back to the first. The time that you were waking up excited to read the Word of God. Like you were excited to read the Word. You couldn't wait to tell others. You had to. By the way, I'm a radically different person. You had to tell somebody. By the way, you couldn't wake up without wanting to pray. Or if I said fasting, you wouldn't fault it and say, oh, Lord. You say, yeah, how can I use this to get closer to him? Like everything that we used to fall in love with the Lord, these different disciplines, we got to go back to those. And by the way, it's not the performance deal. I'm just going to tell you this. It's not the production stuff. It's not how amazing this stuff looks. It's not about fog stuff. It's not about light stuff. It's about you and the Lord. It's about your relationship with Christ. And John just says, man, remember how far you've fallen and repent. And by the way, don't just stay in this period of repentance. Don't just sit there in ashes, right, and dust cloud. Don't just sit there with those things. He says, no, 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 don't stay there. Now I want you to do the works worthy of this repentance. I don't know, I, I think when I look at this text, Kevin, you're absolutely right. He says, by the way, go back to this. I don't know where everybody's at in their own walk with the Lord, but I would tell you this, when you spend time with the Lord, you'll start looking like him. And right now in America specifically, it's really hard to define the church in America. You can say, well, good Lord, that's pretty forward. It's, it's true. I spent 15 years in the United States of America, and I'll stay here in America, and I'll continue to pour into America. I was born on the 4th of July. I have a heart for this country, but by God, please, we've got to start looking like Jesus actually changed our life. And you say, good grief. Otherwise, this is why I say it so forward. He says in Revelation 2, verse 5, if you don't do these things, this is the or else. If you don't do these things, John is so forward. He says this, otherwise I'll come to you. This is Jesus. So the judgment is coming, he says. If you don't remember and repent and do the works, Jesus is coming back and he says, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its plates unless you repent. And you're like, okay, what was the lampstand? Kevin, we talked about this at the very beginning. Remember, we established this. Revelation 1, verse 20. The lampstand is what? The church. It's not salvation, is it? He's not removing somebody's salvation just because I didn't repent. I have a relationship with Christ. He's not saying, I'm taking your salvation card away. I'm not taking the kingdom of God away from you. But you know what he says? I'm removing the church from this place. And you're like, what? The or else is what? The or else says, I'm removing Ephesus from Ephesus, the church. You no longer represent me. You don't reflect me on any level. This word lampstand, if you do a study on lampstand, and you can look even like some practical uh, uh, websites are like got questions. I want to encourage you guys. Read some of these websites. They're simple. They talk through things, but one of them is got questions. And the way they define the lampstand, remember the lampstand originally was the golden lampstand, Kevin, where? Tabernacle. In the tabernacle. Now watch this, okay? So in Exodus, you don't have to go there, but Exodus 25 verse 31, the golden lampstand was in the tabernacle. What was the material made out of, Kevin? Do you remember this? It's kind of a curveball, but it's not it meant to be. It was to be gold. Gold. It was pure gold, hammered, and it was perfected in, an, in, a, in a way according to God. And so here you have this gold, and by the way, gold was the most, most valuable metal, right? We talked about gold a lot of times, Robert. And this gold was tested, Kevin, by how? What would, it, what would gold always be tested by? Uh, fire. Fire. I actually believe that golden lampstand in the tabernacle was a picture, eventually, of the lampstand of the church. Now watch this. Follow me with this if you can. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. 1 Peter 1, verse 7. So that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes through refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, honor, and the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what does he say? He says, this is interesting, that who we are, we are going to be refined by what? Fire. Fire. What are the lampstand? What's the golden lampstand refined by? Fire. He wants it to be pure gold. The church, it's an image beginning this, watch this, the body of Christ. He knows that we're going to be refined by fire. 
Okay, now hang in here. This is kind of be a rabbit trail, but follow me if you can. Zechariah 13, verse 7, 8, and 9. Zechariah 13, 7, 8, and 9, okay? When you get into Zechariah 13, verse 7, 8, and 9, okay? So you have the lampstand and the tabernacle. You have the lampstand, which is the church. Zechariah 13 says, sword, awake against my shepherd, against the man who is my associate. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Kevin, I think I told you the wrong... Yeah, I did. Lord, so have you guys ever not been able to read your handwriting? That would be me. I, I want to just say this. What it says in Zechariah is, without going there, is that when we are refined, uh, that you, it will reveal who the true people of God uh, are. I apologize. I, I'm, that's really not accurate there on that one. But it's in Zechariah 13. Let me just, let me just see this. Oh, there it is. It, it, gets, into verse, it, it gets into verse 9. So let me keep going. I'm sorry. I was there. So in seven, it says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will also turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, this is the Lord's declaration. Uh, Two thirds will be cut off and die. In verse eight, it continues, but a third will be left in it. I will put this third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. Here it is. Then uh, they, they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people and they will say, Yahweh is our God. It's kind of messy, but did you catch that? In the testing, in the refinement, God will show us who uh, the people of God are. Okay, everybody with me on this? This is just an imagery, okay? This is what we're trying to get at of what does the Old Testament point to the New Testament in this. Kevin, are you good? Okay, now when we keep going here, okay, remember this lampstand is in the holy place. Hey, Hebrews 9, verse 2. Okay, this is going to feel like a rabbit trail, but man, it's going to make sense when we get to the end here. Hebrews 9, verse 2. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, were the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Okay, so in this place, okay, here's what you have the holy place. You have a lampstand. How, how many, do you remember how many branches there are, Kevin, on a lampstand? There's seven. Seven, right? You have three on each, right? And then you have one in the middle. And then on each one of the, the lamps, you have an almond branch or an almond flower, right? That displays the quote unquote fruit, okay? So you have a lampstand that's displaying light. Now watch this. Does this light ever go out in the tabernacle? No, it doesn't. The light never goes out. In fact, Aaron and all of his sons were supposed to take care of the light that never went out. Exodus 27, 20 and 21. Exodus 27, 20, and 21. Exodus 27, uh, 20, and 21. It says this. You are to command the Israelites to bring you pure oil from crushed olives for the light in order to keep the lamp burning how often? Continually. In the tent of meeting outside the veil that is in the front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to tend the lamp from evening until morning before the Lord. This is to be a permanent statue for the Israelites throughout the generations. So you have the priests that are supposed to keep the light going. Over and over and over. And it says in 21 at the end, the Israelites throughout all their generations. This is to keep going. The light never goes out. Remember, all 39 books, we believe, point to the coming Messiah. So if the light is to never go out, clearly it's prophesying and painting a picture of Jesus Christ. If you go to Jesus and understand that he is, Kevin, go there, John 8, verse 12, he is what? The light of the, the world. John 8, verse 12, then Jesus spoke to him. He says, I am the light of the world. Anybody who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, when you go to this context, if you follow me, you will never walk in the darkness. But if you've abandoned the first love, what happens? It doesn't look like you're showing light. It doesn't look like I'm showing light if you're walking in this darkness. So Christ is the light of the world. John 1, verse 9. Please write this one down. John 1, verse 9. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So you have a lampstand. Kevin, is there a tabernacle or a temple anymore? Not currently. Not currently. The first temple, second temple, you go back to the tabernacle, that light has gone out. But where has the light now come? It's come through Christ, and it says to everybody, 
who gives light, the true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So now all of a sudden, the light is no longer in a lampstand. The light is no longer in a holy place, in a tabernacle or a temple. The light is now Christ. Now watch this build. So the light is Christ. Now in Matthew 5 verse 14, Matthew 5 verse 14, this is what we're referencing now. Now because the light has come to Christ, scripture says you are the light of the world. You and I are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. When I was in high school, I think this was really crazy. I have no idea why I felt like I was supposed to do this. Uh, but it says in Luke 8, 16, I started a Bible study. It's the weirdest name. We were called Lamps on a Stand. I was a junior in high school. We started a Bible study. And then I made a lamp, a picture of a lamp. Like we just had clip art, right? Okay. And I put it on my top flap of my high school locker. And it, this was it, Luke 8, 16. No one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that all who come in may see the light. You see, there's a progression. Remember, what is the seven stars? They're the angels. What are the seven lampstands? The church. We now have the light. And he says to the church, you, you know what? If you guys don't repent and do these things, I am going to pull the lampstand from this community. I'm going to pull the church of America out. That's what he's saying. I'm going to remove these things. If you're not reflecting me, I don't want you to act like it. That's really drastic. He says in John 1, verse 4 and 5, but watch this, you guys. We are the light of the world, but how does this happen? How do you and I happen? It goes back to the first love. In John 1, verse 4 and 5, watch this unfold. It says, life was in him, and that life was the light of men. So when you abide in Christ, guess what? We are now given life and light. So if you have a relationship with Christ, people will want to see what you have, and they'll, they'll gravitate to it. That's just a realness of what happens. It says in verse 5, that light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. You know what? The light always wins, by the way. The light always wins, and he doesn't need us to shine the light. He'll do it himself. When you keep going into this, this men mentality, 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Now remember, some of us in this process, in this room, watching online, you can say, this is too forward. I'm asking for a spirit of humility today. Because at some point, the church needs to recognize it's not working. In 1 Peter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possessions, so that you may proclaim his, the praises. Now watch this. We already read this today. But it says, The praises of the one who called you out of darkness, what? Into his marvelous light. We are no longer here anymore. We're like in the light. Wherever you go, people should recognize that. Man, I went to a coffee shop this morning. You're, you're learning a pattern. Whenever I study, I go to a coffee shop. <laughs> And you guys, yesterday or today, Drew and I, we went to another coffee shop last, last night. And all we do is just ask a question. And both times, last night and today, people begin to pour out their heart. When there is a genuine light, you guys, people will be attracted to what you have. I, I can't describe it. Like you can't force it. You can't make it happen. It's just you're walking out in marvelous light. And so in 1 John 1 verse 7, here it is. I'm throwing all kinds of verses at you guys, but I gotta get us to understand this. First John 1, verse seven, if not, it's for me, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we live in a posture of the blood of Jesus is cleansing us, guess what? We are his lampstand. We are walking a light. That's all we are. When you realize that Christ has cleansed us, and then that's the purity, and that leads to the passion. Guess what? Everywhere you go, you're like this, what would you say, Kevin? Light bulbs everywhere. <laughs> Whatever your favorite light bulb is everywhere on you, it's the light of Christ. And I, I think for me, we've lost 1 John 1, 7. We've lost this passion of who we were and that we are destined for hell until Christ cleansed us and set us free. When is the church going to wake up to this? If we understood this, we would walk in light and we wouldn't be afraid of anything. 
The fear of God would drive us in every aspect. And so when I look at this text, the only thing I can conclude is John 15, 5, 6, 7, and 8. You guys know this text. John 15, 5, 6, 7, and 8. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. What does that sound like? Right? The lampstand, right? There's these branches, right? They carry the light. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I am him produces what? Fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. This light that we are sharing, it has everything to do with him working in and through us. But then he says in verse 6, if anybody doesn't remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them, they throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. And by the way, this is the beautiful part. My father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. I think it's an awesome picture of a lampstand. I'm going to read something to you guys. Uh, We have an American flag over here. And I know we have churches on that represent Ghana. And I know that we have, I see Apostle Barbara from uh, uh, Botswana. I see we have uh, Apostle Dennis all the way from Uganda. Like we have incredible men and women of God. We have uh, Pastor Diakite from Ivory Coast is on. Like nations are everywhere, you guys. And I want to read something that came out from, uh, uh, from Christianity Today this last March. So this is a very relevant, current article. And I want to give you different sources because I want to show something that I believe is essential. And I want to speak specifically to the American church today. We put this here because I I believe what's coming, if we're not careful, Ephesus is going to become America. The American Enterprise Institute uh, just recently shared that only one out of every four people are going to church in America. 25% are saying, I want to be a part of the body of Christ. I want to go to a physical building, be a part with people. I'm not going to forsake the assembly. One out of four. That seems a little bit drastic, Kevin. Drive around on a Sunday morning. Yep. It's a lot lot happening. That's one study, by the way. The Pew Research Center. They said, and this isn't a prophesy, they have statistics that said in 50 years, America uh, will no longer have Christianity as its major religion. Well, can you imagine one out of four is not going to church in 50 years? You would say, of course that's going to happen that way. How, How does that happen? This. How do you go from so strong in the Lord, you guys, to all of a sudden in 50 years they're predicting that we're no longer going to be a Christian nation? Barna, uh, three years ago, said practicing Christians nearly dropped in half since the year 2000. So in 23 years, half of it has stopped practicing Christianity. One generation. This is real. And what I think is really interesting is that we went after different research companies, Kevin. So this wasn't just a Barna. This wasn't just a Pew. This wasn't an American uh, Institute. Like it was multiple ones. And I I appreciate what is happening. Uh, Daniel Silliman says this. The question is not whether Christianity is now declining in America. The question is, is how fast and how far will it happen? I think this report could come out for the church of Ephesus. I think the church could come out for the church of America and say, hey guys, I know this doesn't sound good, but guess what? It's not too late. If you remember where you've fallen in love and we repent and we don't just stay there and we do the works of what we did at the beginning, I think we could turn it around. But if we don't, you guys, the statistics will continue. Literally a century ago, 82% of the world's Christians lived in Europe and in North America. So a century ago, 82% of all the Christians, the majority, lived in Europe and in North America. Okay, does that make sense? Now watch this statistic. But now there's a new term called the global south. 70% of Christians today are now in the global south. Kevin, if you were to guess, does America, are they included in the global south? Probably not since we're north of the equator. Thank you, Kevin. (laughs) Africa has now more Christians than any continent. Our friends that are online right now. We have more believers in Namibia, 
in Botswana and Rwanda, yes, in Mauritania and Mauritius and Madagascar, all of the continent of Africa, we have more believers there than we do anywhere else. Interesting enough, Latin America, not far behind. Here's one that really rattled me a little bit. I don't know why. Maybe this is a pride deal, and it probably is. English is no longer the most common language spoken amongst Christians. Spanish is. Now, when I say these things, these are a positives, by the way, for Latin America. These are positives for Africa. But how could America go so far? In fact, China eventually, they're predicting, is going to become the largest country of Christians. More than the United States with time. And they're a persecuted church. I have a, I have a quote here that I want to read and close with today. Uh, and it's really, really drastic. But you see, Revive School, we did a two-year Bible uh, school, right, where we taught from Genesis to Revelation. And we originally taught this in Indiana. And when we taught this in Indiana, it went to 50 to 60 to 70 guys, went to maybe 80 guys, and then it went a little bit online, and we had a graduation of like 200 people. And like for us, Kevin, that was a big deal. (laughs) But we had a a video teaching, right, where we showed the Messiah in every book of the Bible. Laura wrote through the whole book a devotional. Interesting enough, we had study guide questions that our team did an incredible job. People have edited these things. And then at the same time, we had lesson plans. So we had an entire thing called Revive School. You can actually go to it. You can be a part of it. That's why we have a lot of listeners today on that. RevivSchool.org, right? And so when we were done, okay, it was kind of like, Lord, what do you want to do with it? So here we are since 2020 to 2023. By God's grace, I'm going to tell you something that's important, not because of pride, but because of what I'm going to quote here. We're now in 83 countries. In three years... God has taken the word of God and he has spread it throughout all of the world. And the only thing I can tell you is, is they're hungry for the truth. They want to grow into the word. They're not saying, oh, I already know this. Like they are hungry for more. And we're not advertising, we're not promoting it, it's just spreading. And in fact, in Malawi, by God's grace, they're praying for 500 groups in Malawi alone. We're over 100 And I have to tell you this, I can hardly get a a revived school in America. Oh, no, 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 we're we're all Bible studied out. I'm telling you, when you're in the word because you love him, not because revived school is the answer, that's not what I'm getting at. But what I'm getting at is when there's a hunger to know more of the Lord, you will begin to live it out in such a way you'll tell people. Why is America so hard? Why is Europe so hard to get into the word? Because I believe we've lost our first love. And he'd say, Church of America, Church of Europe, wake up. And I love this quote, and this is something I can't, I can't describe to people. I can't understand and explain this well, but when you live it, you see it and you experience it. And here's the quote. It says that we believe, this comes uh, from the American, uh, this comes from Christianity Today. It says this, we believe the church in Africa, Latin America, and Asia could actually save the U.S. church. If the American Christians would be willing to assume a posture of humility and learn from our brothers and sisters around the world. I've been asked, why do you go overseas all the time now? I'm here for America, but I will tell you this, because I believe that the nations outside of America, I hope and I pray, makes this nation jealous. You guys, we're going to Malawi because a president is willing, a president is willing to call the whole nation to repent. We're renting four stadiums. Thousands of... I'm there, thousands of pastors. They want to declare the gospel. They want to make him known. They're not afraid to offend people. They're not afraid of like, you're going to make up my building and it's going to be messy. They're not afraid of it's going to mess with your programs. You see, when we live in that place, you know you've lost his first love. And what if the Malawians make the Americans jealous? 
What if the Cameroons, what if they make the Americans jealous and say, well, why are, why are we not doing that? I don't know. But John says, I have an answer for you. If you remember how far you've fallen and you repent and you do these works, you will not perish. I will not pull the church out of your country. But I believe this is a warning for the church. I believe if we don't do these things, we won't have a presence any longer in our country. And I thank God for my friends overseas that want to see a move of God. They're willing to lay it all down because Jesus did for us. So why, why did we put this American flag here uh, on this chair of repentance? Because I, I believe it's a symbol of the church in America needs to repent. I do. Our Time Revive team needs to. Like in America, if this was us, you guys, people would see something different in our country. I think that's where we're at today. I think it's a call to fall back in love with Jesus. Because if that's the case, we're not going to lose the lampstand in this country. If we don't repent and do the works, I believe the lampstand will be gone. And according to statistics, if we're not careful, it's coming faster than we want. And so, Lord, we just come before you. We know that you're the answer. Jesus, you are the light, and you've given us the light. And God, I'm asking that you awaken us to that truth again. God, there's a flag on a chair, and I look at this flag, and I just pray that the church in America would repent. We'd remember all the things that uh, that we've experienced in your love because we know what you've done. And I pray, God, that when we repent, we begin to see change. And when we see change, we'd see maybe a move of God in this country. And God, until then, may we learn from our brothers and sisters overseas. May they come into our country. We welcome believers to come into our country and model what this first love looks like. God, we need help. We need help. And we know you can do that. We know you can do that through Christ. (laughs) And I thank you for still giving us a chance. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you for being a part of today. It's kind of a little bit more forward, but um, I do believe it's real. And I do believe there's hope. I do believe there's a possibility for this country. But I think in Revelation chapter 2, it gives us the answer of how. And so uh, thanks for your time today. Thanks for those that are online. Thanks for your participation in Kenya and in Richardson and Ghana. Always a blessing uh, from our friends from Cameroon. Have a great evening for those that are over there. And for those that are here, have a great afternoon. Thanks.